this will be episode nine of our podcast. So we're here with Megan. Megan, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Megan. Um, I'm audience development manager here at Alari. I've been here for about nine years now, can you believe? Um, but in this role for uh, about three years now. Right, okay. Do you want to tell us a bit more about your role, what's involved? Yeah, in sure. So I guess it's fundamentally about making sure that the Larry as an organisation is welcoming to everybody, on the one hand, but also looking at ways we can encourage people to have a longer term relationship with the Larry. They're not just coming once a year to see the Christmas show, yeah. they're coming um, on a more regular basis and they see it as somewhere they can bring everyone, the whole family to, their friends, their elderly grandma, toddlers, basically. So it's kind of two sides. It's the, are we, are we as open and welcome and accessible to everyone? Mm -hmm. And do people feel like they can come here regularly and enjoy what's on there? Yeah. So what sort of things have you been doing recently to add to that sort of offering to people? Yeah. Oh, so many. <laughs> um, so I guess we look at, well, our starting point is that we always look at who's our community. Right. And we look at... Primarily at Salford, but also at Greater Manchester in the wider northwest. And we look at who, who, who are the people that are out there, what are people's backgrounds, what are people's um, ages, ethnicities, um, access needs, all that sort of thing. And then we say, does the audience that we've got here reflect that wider population? Yeah. And if it doesn't, what do we do about that? So, specifically, say with age, obviously, it's a fairly undeniable fact that most people that go to the theatre are of a certain age, yeah, yeah, <laughs> or yeah. predominantly yeah. An, an older crowd. Um, and that's to do with all sorts of different factors. Money is a really big one. Mm. Um, yeah, people who are that bit older tend to have a bit more spare cash. Yeah. Uh, time, another big one. Mm. You know, matinees, mm. so, you know, uh, people who are retired can come to a show in the middle yeah. of the afternoon. So, we obviously don't want to just be in a venue for older people. We no. want to say young people are welcome here and we have something that is appealing to young people. So, you look at the ways you can overcome those barriers. So, if it's about money, we make the tickets cheaper. Um, if it's about the shows that are on offer, we talk to our programming team to try and make sure we have something that would be interesting to a younger person. Um, so, yeah, there is a, there's a formal membership scheme for young people under 26. They get £10 tickets. Lucky things. I wish I could still get them. <laughs> oh, no, I know, I do. So nice, so nice. Um, but we also work a lot with our learning team to make sure that the programme and the stuff that's on the stage is as well. Yeah, so how do you sort of, how do you reflect what you put on here with the conversations you really, with, that you're having with the community? Do you yeah. ask them for what sort of things they're into? Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, we don't, to be perfectly honest, we probably don't go out and ask as much as we should, and that's something we'd like to improve. Um, I guess we get a lot of information through our um, databases and what our customers are doing and how they're behaving. We get a lot of stuff from um, places like the census and various big sort of data studies that are done to look behaviour and trends. And there are um, organisations out there that are set up to support arts organisations in providing data and stuff like that. So it's actually quite a numbers heavy job set of yeah. Quite yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's exciting. Um, one of the big things for me, um, as we've been working with the Lowry from the very beginning really, because we ran our first pilot here, um, is the sort of, I think, the Lowry is at the forefront of accessibility. Yeah. Do you want to talk about some of the more bespoke things that the Lowry does that a lot of, what, not a lot of other places do at the minute and what yeah. sort of needs to change in the industry as a whole, do you think? Sure, yeah. Well, thank you for picking it up because it's something we, we work really hard on and we're really quite proud of. Um, mm. We're not perfect, it's an awful lot of work no, we do. No. Um, but it's something we're really committed to, I think, as an organisation. I think we're really lucky in that it's a relatively modern building. Yeah. It's only 20 years old. Um, and it's an interesting building as well. It's, an it's interesting not, building. you know, you've just got a front door and yeah. uh, all the different yeah. shapes and the layout is really, really. Yeah, really absolutely. Different. And I think that gave us a little bit of a head start, to be honest, in that physical accessibility is not too much no. an issue here. We're very aware of that. We're very aware that we have that head start on, say, some of the older Victorian theatres and yeah. Edwardian theatres that yeah. have huge and small organisations have huge challenges just making the big front door wheelchair accessible, for example. Yeah. Um, so I think we took that, we said, okay, well, we can't be complacent just no. because we've got... Uh, I think you've done it all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. oh, we right get wheelchairs in, we're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, accessibility tip. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And I think that's not, not where we're at at all. Um, we want to say, yep, yeah, fine, but yeah. how can we go well beyond that? Um, and 
I think the other thing that really works in our favour is that it's a cross-organisational thing. It's not just my thing. It's not just me bleating on the back. It's not like time. Absolutely. I mean, yes, I lead it, but the commitment is real from so, the organisation. Sorry to interrupt, but is that common amongst the industry, or is that something unique to here? I think it varies from place to place. I think in a big organisation like here, it's possibly a little bit easier. Mm. Um, small organisations, you'll tend to find there's like one person who's the champion. Well, you think it'd be the other way around. You would. Because there's less people, you think yeah. more people, everyone would be on board and it would work yeah. the other way around, which is yeah. interesting. I think, it, I think just small organisations where people are very stretched, and you've often got, I mean, in my previous job, I was a marketing team of one. So you're trying to do so many different yeah. things. You actually don't have the the space for someone to be that champion um, and to drive things forward. So it's, it's, it's a nice, luxurious position to be in in some oh. ways. But on the flip side, the other side of that is because we're so big, because we're so prominent locally, our audiences hold us to really high standards. Mm. And they're very quick to tell us when we get it wrong. And they're very quick to point out, you're the Larry, you should be doing it better. <laughs> um, then, and I think that's we're very conscious of that, that we, we have a responsibility as a, as a big yeah. organisation to try and get yeah. it right. Um, so we have a, an internal group of representatives, hopefully fairly senior representatives from each department in the organisation. We meet every six weeks just yeah. to discuss what we're up to. Um, Access-wise, what our kind of current challenges are, mm -hmm. try and push things forwards, and I think that really just helps to kind of keep it, keep it on the agenda for everybody. Of course, keep, uh, keep of course it does, and I think it's quite unique for, especially such a large organisation, for it to be so much on the agenda. It's really reflected with what you provide to customers. Yeah. Which I think, you know, for example, um, for me having a sister with autism and knowing a lot of people with autism, the Involuntary noise policy, I think, is really unique and something that I've never seen. It. I've never seen an involuntary noise policy for any other theatre or any other venue. I think it's something that other venues need to learn from the Lowry. Have you had any feedback on that from other organisations that are interested to find yeah. out more? Yeah, we have actually. Um, it's something we're really quite proud of, I think, in that we were. I think one of the first. I, don't, I, I hate to say we were the first because someone out there will challenge yeah, us on it, yeah, I'm sure. Of course, yeah. Um, but yeah, that came about. Um, really interesting, it came about because we had a particular show which was very quiet. It was a play, mm. it was very quiet, it was very um, intense and very um, focused experience for that audience. And we did have a number of audience members in who made involuntary noise. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we had a number of customers complain. Mm. It's going back a couple of years now, um, and that provoked a lot of really quite soul-searching conversation mm. amongst the senior team here. Um, there was lots of conversation on both sides of the argument. You know, like there's somebody in the theatre there who's paid for two or fifty pounds for a ticket. As far as they're concerned, they've had their night disturbed by somebody making a monetary yeah. noise. Yeah. On the other hand, the person who's made the noise also has a right to enjoy their evening in the theatre. Yes. So there was a lot of debate internally, and I think we decided that we came down quite strongly on the idea that, that we we want to welcome everybody. Yeah. And if welcoming everybody means welcoming people who may make a noise during the show, mm. so be it. Yeah. You know, um, but we needed to come up with a a way of handling those customers who perhaps found that a challenge. Yeah. In a way that made them feel valued, um, and took their concerns really seriously, but also really stood by that commitment that everyone is welcome here. And if you make an involuntary noise, fine, that's absolutely no problem at all. So it's a combination of how do we how do we look after both camps? <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> also, I think one. it's a bit of a learning exercise for yeah. people who don't come across disability or people with autism, and a bit of a learning exercise around sort of tolerance. And you know, these people aren't deliberately trying to disturb your um, your night, your evening. They can't help it. It's an element of their disability. And I think I just, I just think the Lowry should be really commended for thinking outside the box and not just <laughs> not just going on the side of the people who complain. But actually, we should be a bit more tolerant as an organisation, as the public. Why don't we all just take a step back and appreciate people for who they are? I would like to hope that's the way society will be, you know, as, the, the, you know, back in the day people with disabilities in some ways were, were kept hidden, mm. were kept in institutions yeah. or, in, you know, mm. whatever, and yeah. that, that thankfully has changed, mm. people are now more visible.
visible, they're out in society, they're out in the community. I think as that shift is happening, organisations have to respond to it as well. And like you say, it's about educating, I hate using the word educating, it sounds terribly patronising. No, I know. But about just, just shifting the, the thoughts of people who, who may not have encountered that in their daily lives. Yeah. You know, they may be of a generation where they didn't see people out and about who had autism, made in monetary noise, and looked and different, it, sounded different. I think it goes a step further. I think what it does, which would be amazing, is we do away with the whole let's have a relaxed performance about this so it's accept it's almost acceptable to have people making voluntary noises and we accommodate the light and the sound or whatever. It's just everything is accessible and you can go everywhere. I think this policy takes it a step further whereas it's like all our shows are accessible because we're open and welcome to all shows and I think that is a real paradigm shift not only for the industry for the industry but for just the public in general that we shouldn't have specific shows where someone with autism goes or someone with dementia goes to this show because of X, Y and Z. They, their was accommodations are just made across the board for everything. Yeah. It's really interesting that because we have, um, obviously we have a programme of relaxed and dementia friendly shows, but you often hear more from, I think it's, often that's more for the, the parents and carers mm. than it is for the rest of the audience. Like sometimes we have, um, we have a, a scheme where we invite families who've never been to the theatre before, who have a child with a disability, yeah. to come for the first time and we support them and through that process. And a lot of the feedback we get from them is that, oh, now I feel confident that I can take my son to the theatre. And you're like, you always could, and you can come to any show you wanted. And if your child is restless or makes noise, that's fine. But for them, they like the support for the performance. Just that, that first exactly. experience so being people, a bit more yeah. stress free to feel a bit more confident, to feel like, yeah, okay, the Larry says they're welcoming all the time, but on this, okay, I know it's going to be next level at this performance because it's relaxing. I think, I like, think okay, a lot, it's a for, for a lot of parents and carers, the, the stresses will become because you, you can't choose your audience. Yeah. It'd be great yeah. if we all had pe people around us who are accepting yeah. and, you know, willing to accommodate any behaviours but we can't be guaranteed that and that's the sort of anomaly that I think might stop people coming through the front door but yeah. I think the Lowry and you know other places that I've been with my sister like the Octagon, the sort of policies and the, the staff are so receptive to making that experience a good one that you want to go back and I think it goes for any business really if you have a great experience and the people support you the first time you're a customer for life. So, I mean, me and my sister have been to tens, tens of shows. Tens of shows doesn't sound that much, but yes. tens of shows here. Just because we know we have a good experience, we know the booking process, we know that they get the accommodations we need because you have the sort of the access card. You have the access card now. You have your own. We have a register. You, you have, have your a card or something. Yeah. Same, same idea. Yeah. Same idea where all people. Do you want to talk a bit more about that? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So that came about. Um, Really, because we wanted to, it was twofold. Really, we wanted to improve the customer experience for looking here, and we also wanted to just promote what we were doing access wise a little bit. So, we offer free tickets for um, anyone who needs a carer. But for that to happen, you need to join our access register. It's really simple, it's just a one off declaration of your requirements. And what that means is we can keep those requirements on the booking system and not have to ask you every time you book. Yeah. Oh, do you know what? We know it, it's there yeah. already. So yeah. the, the can you provide us with the doctors now? Oh, doctors none of that, all. none of that. It's yeah. one off and it's done. And it's we don't ask about um, uh, conditions as such, we ask about need. Like, what do you need? I don't, I don't, I don't care what condition your child has, I care yeah. about what can we do to it's make them very much make them a social better. model of this. Exactly, that, that, exactly that. And I think that it'll take some time to bed in, um, but it seems to be getting there. The other thing it does is it opens up online booking for the first time um, for people who need. Um, say they want to come to an audio describe performance. Until now, they'd have had to phone up and said, "Can I get the audio describe right, so price?" Online, yeah. yeah. So once we know your need, it applies a, It does something technical and clever. It applies something <laughs> to your online account. Yeah, yeah. You click a button, and it, it you can then book Perfect. it online. So it's, it's it was a bit of a slog to get that, and a, and a lot of organisations are doing it. We're not unique in doing it, mm. but it just it's about easing that process and not making people feel that every time they come here, they have to tell us their whole medical history or whatever. Yeah, it's just who wants oh, to do it's that? unpleasant. Who, and wants to like, do that? who wants to do that? No, yeah. It's just all there, and we know that Mr. Jones needs an ILC to all, you know, 
you know, Mrs. Smith needs a wheelchair space, yeah. it's there. They don't need to tell us it's there mm. on their records. And one of the really good things that I think Larry does is the boxes space that you provide for people, because that's something that we access quite right. often, because yeah. sometimes, again, because we're not in control of who sits around us, and yeah. what, you know, the big thing for my sister is food. Right. People have a lot of different foods around and we've got a really strict diet so it can be a massive temptation and a bit of a distraction so the sort of being separate from the audience but getting the same sort of experience I think is a real unique offering mm. to because I don't know of anywhere else that offers that. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, again that comes from that's that's fortunate architecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In that those boxes were designed into the building but yeah. we've taken them on and said we're going to use those as spaces for people who might need them yeah, in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect, it's perfect. And the, se the similar sort of things is, is happening in sport with the sensory boxes, mm -hmm. but that's where they've took a corporate box right. and turned it into a sensory thing for autistic fans to use during games and make that a bit more accessible. Right. But I think this is, it just feels a bit more holistic that it, you've got like eight yeah. around the lyric yeah. where people can access it and has is it six seats in there? Yeah, can, well, yeah. it can be any, up to, up to six. We yeah. can so where do you think, where, where is the Lowry going next? What things are you working on? What, what's the sort of next stage for, for your job? What things are in the future for you? Um, there's a few sort of practical things on the horizon. We're fundraising like crazy to hopefully um, get a changing places facility, right, okay. uh, which is something we've actually got a lot of pressure from our audiences for that, mm -hmm. rightly so. Mm -hmm. um, we're putting on more work and more shows that are um, suitable or designed for people with um, profound disabilities mm -hmm. and it's quite awkward that we don't necessarily mm -hmm. always have the facilities yeah. to be able to complete that visit for them. Um, so that's something that's really high on the agenda. It's very expensive. Um, mm -hmm. We're a charity. Yeah. Um, so we're doing our best, but yeah. we hope that that will happen within a year or two. Uh, watch this space. Yeah. We've done the feasibility study, we've worked out where to put it, so that was, yeah, that was well, challenge number one. Yeah, well, um, and yeah, and I think we've discovered as well there isn't another facility in the whole of Salford. Yeah, absolutely. Really? We'd be the only facility in the city of Salford. You'd think the shopping centre would have one. Exactly. No, not even at Media City. Um, There's not one at Media City. No. <laughs> wow, that does shock me. Yeah, yeah, That's, it shocked us. Because, because really. Yeah. I mean, there's talk about changing places being in building rigs. Yeah. Now for, because I think, yeah. especially with that being such a brand, well, it's not brand new anymore, but a relatively new past five years Absolutely. building, you'd think they'd have at least one. Yeah. I mean, there's two in Wigan Town Centre. That's I think. amazing. There's one in the library and there's one in the leisure centre That's within amazing. 100 yards of each other. Yes, which, there you go. There you know, go. And there are other, um, a lot of theatres in Manchester going through yeah. big redevelopments at the moment to kind of bring them. Mm. bring the standards up and they are incorporating those facilities I know of one for sure that have committed to including one in their mm. development so for us to kind of be a high standard we're going to have to do it we're going to have to you know, push, yeah, push, for that. It. push for it um, so that's a big thing that's on the horizon we're hoping to get our gold accreditation from Attitude is Everything oh, yeah. soon I'm currently do you want to talk a bit more about Attitude yeah. Is yeah sure so um, they are an organisation who kind of Primarily deal with music venues. We're a multi arts venue, so we yeah. sort of sneak in there, yeah. we're having gigs every now and then. <laughs> but they are they're great. I can't recommend them enough. They um, provide a really simple, actionable kind of roadmap for organisations that want to get better at doing access, basically. Mm. And if you, I mean, any organisation would benefit, but I could see a small, a, a small organisation just having that toolkit to hand to help you through that process would be so, so useful. Um, so as well as kind of bespoke guidance, they um, they have a bronze and gold accreditation system, um, which is all about the kind of um, standards that you're meeting in, so that audiences can have a bit of trust in what you are to display that. So we're currently silver, um, and we've just, I think, in the last year, done the things that we need to do to get gold accredited. So I need to write the submission and get it in. Really? Hopefully, yeah. I'll say yes, yeah. touch wood. Um, but they're also just really good at um, uh, answering queries on the mm. fly. When we, when we were doing putting our access register in place, I had all sorts of moments when I went, oh, I don't understand, am I doing this right? And I could just drop them an email and say, what do you think? And oh, get cool. a response straight away from someone who's an expert in the field. Yeah. Um, so are they a disability-led organisation? Uh, yes, they are. Um, mixed. Yes. Um, but they certainly have a staff team that yeah. is a diverse team. 
um, which is great so that you yeah. know you're getting uh, real, so genuine, yeah, real life, real real life world advice, experience. Advice, yeah. And they're all passionate, passionate music fans, all the stuff. Mm. Um, so they've been to a lot of festivals and yeah. a lot of venues and they really get it. There know, is a big pu push for the festivals, in particular, being more yeah. accessible, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, we were nominated for sub um, what's the word? Shortlisted for yeah. one of their awards this year for our work with Facts Social. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we didn't win, but you know, we were highly oh, commended. Like you know, and I got to go to an award ceremony, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 Free absolutely. Food, so they're really, they're really, really good outfit, and I definitely recommend them. They definitely felt like a kind of a, a hand holder for me. Because, yeah. uh, you know, I, I don't know as well as this, but knowing that you've got no. someone who you can ask a question. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you, Megan.